Oh, actually, the uh, title starts with traveling ahead, how Wallace Stegner's most quotable words guide us through time and space. And that, like a number of my other remarks, has a little bit of irony because I am traveling behind, having just arrived after everyone else. My uh, husband's 50th birthday was last night, so I couldn't get here till tonight and looked at that title and thought, traveling ahead. Well, Mr. Stegner did it. I didn't myself. Um, I'm very grateful for the invita invitation and happy to have this chance to do various things, one of which is uh, to pay the tribute to his quotable words, the other to recognize some elements of humor in Wallace Stegner's character and conduct that I think he would very much want to have on our, on our mind. So I begin with a couple of personal stories of how I first met him in 1988. He came to a conference we had at the Center of the American West at the University of Colorado. It was our launching uh, conference. Needless to say, we went downhill after our launching conference since we had Mr. Stegner there the first time. Uh, I was very excited about meeting him, and various events occurred that were pretty funny. There was, we were in a, a U, sitting around a U-shaped table that had those ridiculous skirts or aprons on them, and the microphone was supposed to be moving around to the different people asking him questions. Uh, actually, it was... It was squared, there was really no way to get into the middle of that area. The microphone reached its limit of its wire, and there was no way to get it to move from one side to the other without someone doing what I finally decided I had to do. I should give it background and tell you that Mr. Stegner knew that I was the official university fool at Yale, Harvard, and University of Colorado. So, but I don't recommend this activity to anyone who has fragile dignity. It suddenly just became clear the only way to get that damn microphone to move from one side to the other was for someone to crawl under the table and come up from under that skirt, which is the silliest thing I have ever done in a public place. But I thought someone must do it. So I went under the thing. And as I came out, which is the silly, you feel like the creature of the dark lagoon or something coming out, Mr. Stegner said, don't worry a bit. She's well known as a fool. So that was true and a comfort. Uh, I had a Volkswagen Bug at that time that had lost all of its upholstery. And so it, that was fine. That was not a problem. All you had to do was just think before you sat back. If you tried a lateral move in the front seats, you would snag. But if you just were careful about leaning back. So Charles Wilkinson said to me that I should take Mr. Stegner down to the place where we were all going for a beer at the end of the conference. I said, oh, I only have the VW. He said, you cannot put Wallace Stegner in that VW. Which I later learned, Judy Austin at the Idaho Historical Society had driven him around Idaho in a Volkswagen that was about in the same condition. So in fact, you could put Wallace Stegner in a VW like that. Um, and I think that's something that he would want us to remember about him. And then the, the final incident I wanted to tell for sense of humor, but also introduce a theme I'll conclude with. Um, oh my lord. 50 people had brought all of their libraries for him to autograph. So that's probably 80 people or 90 people. I've never seen more autograph hounds in my life. And they all had multiple, multiple copies. So at the end of his talk, Mr. Stegner sat down. It was a considerably higher stage than this. He was seated on the stage in a chair, just working his way through. Um, helps to have somebody who knew the drudgery of farm work doing that kind of thing, I think, just signing and signing and signing and signing. And I realized um, that he would probably want a beer, and because he had a beer on another occasion, and I knew that he, there was a particular brand of Western beer, I won't name, that he had an aversion to because of the politics associated with that. <laughs> and I looked at the available beer, and I thought, oh no, there's only one or two that are not associated with that politics that he didn't approve of. Um, so I grabbed one of the non-politically troubling beers, and I went up on stage, and I suddenly realized I was the only person on the stage standing. Mr. Stegner was seated, and then all the acolytes with their books were all lined up into the distance there. And it seemed very uncomfortable and very awkward as a young person to be standing to be the only person at that at all. So I couldn't think of anything else to do. I didn't bother to think. I just sank down on one knee and <laughs> held the Paps Blue Ribbon <laughs> out to him. And then that brought everyone's attention to me because that was an unusual thing to see, a person down on one knee holding out a beer. And so, so Mr. Stegner looked a little surprised and then he, uh, he, reached, he took the beer, but he kissed his fingers and he placed his fingers on my forehead and he said, rise and sin no more. 
so. Now that is, um, as everyone in the room knows, that's hard advice to follow. And so that will get to my punchline and I'm going to make a concerted effort to get my watch out here so I don't get carried away. This audience is a very fine audience and I have my watch here. So I will yield when it's time for lunch. Um, okay, so this is in several parts. The first part of my talk is about uh, the personal relationship, which I have, have covered. I did have one thing I just want to say, I'm sure it would be all right with the person who was involved with this. Uh, a senator from a western state had an event at the Library of Congress to honor Mr. Stegner uh, a number of years ago, and he, the senator asked me to write the introduction for Mr. Stegner. So I did write the introduction. The senator gave the introduction, and I heard later from the Stegners, Mary Stegner said that they had both, both she and Wally had gone up to the senator and said, you know, we have heard Wally introduced hundreds of times, but that was the best introduction. And the senator said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, felt, I thought, oh, this is like Cyrano de Bergerac here. Here I am. Um, and I'm happy to say that before his death, my identity was revealed, and he knew I was the author of that. Okay, so um, then my, my second part after the personal items here is to, is to go over some of the places in Mr. Stegner's writing, these quotable words, where it does look um, either like direct influence, synchronicity, simultaneous convergence from different directions, and I will give a big prize to a researcher who can find out how old I was and what year it was when I read his, um, a number of his essays, especially the introduction, the 1979 introduction to the sound of mountain water. I would really like someone to find out when I read that because I either ripped him off in big ways without citation or I read it after I had started writing The Legacy of Conquest and found it to be ratification and affirmation, or I didn't read it until after The Legacy of Conquest came out, in which case it was just a joyful convergence. So there may be other topics of plagiarism to be discussed at this forum here, depending on how people sort this out for me. I don't think I had read, when I was writing Legacy, I think I was behind the times, and I don't believe I had read that 1979 introduction, but heaven's sake, when we get here, and look at some of these things, you do have to wonder. I also want to stick with this theme of humor and say a few words as I'm referring to these passages about some of the humorous consequences that came from finally reading those passages and trying to act on them. So um, three or four places in which my, my connection and also the connection of this thing called the New Western History seems so very direct uh, that it's well, either extraordinary convergence or one of those great moments in life where you read something and it seeps into your mind and it seems to be in your mind and you don't ask yourself, uh, young people in the room, ask yourself so you don't have these embarrassing moments when you're in front of people. Okay, so the 100th meridian and aridity in the West. That would be one of the first things to start with here. What a uh, forceful set of quotations it would take the rest of the afternoon if I read the particularly apt and forceful quotations from Mr. Stegner asking us to pay attention to aridity. But I'm using this particular one because it's an excellent one, um, and it does actually play off the remark about Iowa and its greenness in an interesting way. So here we have um, Mr. Stegner speaking in that introduction to the Sound of Mountain Water about the 100th Meridian, beyond which unassisted agriculture is dubious or foolhardy, and beyond which one experiences the western feel a dryness in the nostrils, a cracking of the lips, a transparent crystalline quality of the light, a new palette of gray, sage green, sulfur yellow, buff, turn, uh, toned white, rust red, a new flora and fauna, a new ecology. Now, that passage led to two or three amusing outcomes, and the outcomes came after his death, so I never got to share them with him. But one was that that passage, and others like that, where he reflects on the color green, has made me crazed and obsessed with the battiness in Western America of calling the environmental movement the Green Movement. <laughs> if there was ever a more inappropriate <laughs> green, ladies and gentlemen, is the color of the Bureau of Reclamation. It is the color of disturbed ground. It is the color of where you have taken water and diverted it. Bright green is not, that is the color of disturbance. So, so that, uh, those passages has made me, uh, I guess, I can only be an irritation to everyone now because that's kind of a cooked goose, the green thing, but that's striking. Then another comical episode, uh, 
a dryness in the nostrils, a cracking of the lips. That phrase got us going at the South American West, and we thought, wouldn't it be interesting for a publication we were doing to find out whether chapstick sales are disproportionate in the West? And so, so we started a correspondence with various lip balm companies. And we, we wanted no industrial secrets, no trade secrets. We just wanted to know whether proportionate to the population, whether chapstick sells at, at a higher rate in the West. Uh, chapstick thought we were up to something and went pretty defensive. And finally, the, all that we could get out of chapstick as a, as a statement they would let us quote was this one, chapstick can neither confirm nor deny. The <laughs> So, okay. Um, well, I guess for brevity's sake, I should, I'll just say that I'm in total agreement with um, Philip Fredkin about the value of that book, One Nation, and how much that deserves to have greater attention. I was actually sitting next to Mr. Stegner at a, at a California Studies conference where he was about to get an award when Jim Houston began reading from One Nation. And I said to Mr. Stegner, I, don't, I didn't know you wrote those things. He said, nobody does. People should know more about that. So I think that would be in his spirit to get that out. But the places where our intersection is so evident, and I'll just read a couple of these because they sound like the marching orders for the legacy of conquest. Uh, he, well, I'll just, this great passage from History, Myth, and the Western Writer in 1967, included in Sound of Mountain Water, where he speaks of the amputated present in Western writing. I want only to underscore the point about the absence of a present in Western literature and in the whole tradition we call Western. It remains rooted in the historic, the rural, the heroic. It does not take account of time and change. This means that it has no future either. Nostalgia, however tempting, is not enough. Disgust for the shoddy present is not enough. And forgetting the past entirely is a dehumanizing error. One of the lacks through all the newly swarming regions of the West is that millions of Westerners, old and new, have no sense of a personal and possessed past, past. no sense of, a, of any continuity between the real Western past, which has been mythicized almost out of recognizability, and a real Western present that seems as cut off and import, as pointless as a ride on a merry ground that can't be stopped. But if you are any part of an artist, and lots of people are some part of one, then I think you don't choose between the past and the present. You try to find the connections. You try to make the one serve the other. And as he goes on, in the old days, in blizzardy weather, we used to tie a string of lariats from house to barns so as to make it from shelter to responsibility and back again. With personal, family, and cultural chores to do, I think we had better rig up such a line between past and present. Now, really, <laughs> if I read that and I didn't cite it, my wretched colleague Ward Churchill and I have more in common than I realized. You may recall Ward Churchill had some problems with failure to cite things. I don't think I had read that at the time of writing Legacy, but in some ways that could have been the introduction for the book. That was so much my intention and mission. Um, other dimensions of his, his writing, he wrote wonderfully about how Westerners themselves modeled their behavior off of the um, Wild West shows, movies, television, dime novels, etc. This great quotation uh, from the introduction to The Sound of Mountain Water. Nobody devours Western, Westerns more hungrily than the bona fide cowhand. Nobody is so helplessly modeled by a fictional image of himself. What directly affects the cowhand indirectly affects people who have never had close acquaintance with a horse or a cow. Lots of clerks and soda jerks in the urban West are partly what fact and history have made them and partly what the romantic imagination and traditional stereotypes tell them to be. Now for me, I know that when I read that passage, that took me beyond where I was in legacy because I thought, oh, no wonder the separating of the myth from the actuality is not a viable task. So much behavior and conduct has been shaped by people thinking they are riding the range as they go to work on 17th Street in Denver and engage, I guess they're still engaging in stock transitions there. I don't know if they are not, but uh, so, so, a number of ways in which he anticipated in, the, in, that, uh, in his essays the whole struggle to find an alternative valuation for natural resources, Tom Powers' work, uh, for that matter, Richard Florida, a very telling quotation. Uh, instead of losing its best and brightest, the Rocky Mountain West now draws some of its, of its best and brightest from elsewhere. It draws some of them because of the new opportunities it offers. And here's Tom Powers' uh, work from the University of Montana, his economist trying to help us find the post-cowboy economy. It draws more because of the preserved wilderness, the clean air and water, the pure sky, the space that have always been there and that grow more precious 
as we build our national termite life. So, okay. So I could, I'm going to do that thing. Audiences so love it when they see that a speaker is attentive to time and is taking notes and hussing them. <laughs> they, just, they like that. But I'm sorry to have to do that because there were quite a number of other things that I, I wanted to uh, quote, and I'll hope maybe a question will come to that. Well, now, for uh, part three of my talk, what I want to shift to is my own plan on how to look at Wallace Stegner's long-term legacy and to reconcile um, contradictions and inconsistencies and basically humanness in his story. I have a copy of a book uh, that's rarely out there when you're seeing all of Wallace Stegner's books looked at called Selected American Prose, 1841 to 1900, The Realistic Movement, edited with an introduction by Wallace Stegner in 1958. Why I have that book, and keep it where I can always find it, um, I have the book, and that tells us what an interesting intertwined tale we're all in here. When I was at Santa Cruz, I signed up to take Paige Stegner's class on the realism movement of the late 19th century. I was waffling and wobbling, I guess maybe I still am, as, as Professor Eller's comment started us off on whether I was going to be in history or English. So I bought all the books for Paige Stegner's class, including Selected American Prose, 1841 to 1900. I read them with pleasure, and then I dutifully enrolled in the history classes that had, in my mind, become the path for my future. But I had the books, um, and at the end of that book, Selected American Prose, is the wonderful Twain essay on James Fenimore Cooper's literary offenses an essay that you always want to have at your fingertips if you don't have it now. There's 19 rules governing literary art in the, um, and then, then Twain applies those rules to the Cooper's Deerslayer and finds that Cooper violated 18 of those rules. <laughs> and these are rules as appropriately uh, imposed on history as on the writing of fiction. My favorite, favorite, well, there's two favorites. One of them is when Twain says, these rules require that the personages in a tale shall be alive except in the case of corpses, and that always the reader shall be able to tell the corpses from the others. <laughs> but this detail has often been overlooked in the Deerslayer tale. Um, the second one is my favorite. is the one about how they, uh, you should be able to tell the good people from the bad people. You should like the bad people, but in a Cooper novel, you just want them all to get drowned together. <laughs> so those are helpful insight. So, so that book has never gone away from me. I don't recall when I read the, for, the introduction by Wallace Stegner until the last couple of weeks. And that was where I got my guidance on how to go about appraising Mr. Stegner's long-range written um, legacy to us. The answer is basically do unto others as they would do unto you, or treat Wallace Stegner with the same respectful but penetrating criticism with which he treated William Dean Howells, Mark Twain, Henry James, and other realist writers. So it seems to me interesting and telling that this introduction begins with a quotation with Stegner quoting another critic, Harry Levin, who said, a writer may reconcile in practice things intractably contrary in theory. So that's a clue as to how to go about looking at Stegner's uh, whole work. The realities of post-Civil War America combine such incongruous tendencies, Stegner wrote, that one is half tempted to wonder if the embracing of incompatibilities is not always a rule of creative nature. If, to paraphrase Henry Adams, chaos is the law of writers and order the dream of critics. So, um, to give just one very telling example from, from this, his appraisal of William Dean Howells, who I uh, have always liked and admired, and I think I'm finally beaten down. I asked so many groups of undergraduates to read The Rise of Silas Lapham and had them all. Well, I'm not doing that anymore. I'll just say that. So, so what's wrong with them is really the question about that. Anyway, William Dean Howells, uh, when Stegner's discussing him, he mentions that, that, uh, that infamous quotation where Howells said that American writers should, should write about the more smiling aspects of American life and should deal with the commonplace and not the, the catastrophic. But then he quotes another literary critic who points out that even though Howells is saying, oh, let's write about the happy things, this critic sums up Howells's plots. Quote, three plots turn on train wrecks, three on fires, two characters are removed by brain fever, a number by sudden sicknesses, two committed suicide with poison, one hero is shot, another knocked down by a horse car, and two others killed by locomotives. So consistency, 
maybe not. Um, so in any case, that struck me as the way that I would like to go about this uh, last two sections of my talk here, to think about applying that acceptance, maybe even celebration of inconsistency that Mr. Stegner offered to Howells and James and Twain, and to offer that to him. Our minds, the premise here is that our minds are quilts and mosaics. They are hybrid, they are mixed, they are rarely pure. When they are pure, it's time to see a neurologist and to see what is malfunctioning there. It is a pretty bad quilt or mosaic that is pure or consistent. And it is likewise a pretty dull literary heritage that is pure and consistent. So contradictions, some are chronologically appearing in writers' works, sequential, and some of them are simultaneous. Okay, now for a couple of these examples of contradictions in Stegner's work, which I value and celebrate and am grateful for. His excellent essay, The Rediscovery of America, 1946, as he wrote in the preface when he put this into a collection, these essays probably show me getting my education in public. For example, I'm amazed to find myself in The Rediscovery of America speaking admiringly of Hoover Dam and Lake Mead. Now I know enough not to speak admiringly of reclamation dams without looking closely at their teeth. But I have not changed the essay or any of the essays except to cut away a little dullness and update a few facts. So good for him, he left it in there. And I shall now read his passage on Lake Mead, and I shall say very clearly that I am not reading this to mock it, to regret it, to do any hindsight quarterbacking on it. And one reason I'm not doing it in that spirit is because this passage is pretty close to what I felt in September of 2007, the last time I was at Hoover, Hoover Dam. So here's Mr. Stegner on, um, well at that time Boulder Dam, but Hoover Dam now. Two days on Lake Mead and an afternoon and evening going through the dam and the powerhouses have made boosters of us. Nobody can visit Boulder Dam itself without getting that World's Fair feeling. It is certainly one of the world's wonders, that sweeping cliff of concrete, those impetu impetuous elevations, the labyrinths of tunnels, the huge power stations. Everything about the dam is marked by the immense, smooth, efficient beauty that seems peculiarly American. Though no architect designed it and no one mind planned its masses and details, it has the effect of great art, and the dam itself is only the beginning. And then he goes on to talk about the uh, economic impacts of that. Is that an embarrassment? He seems to have been a little bit embarrassed by it. I find myself so much, as a middle-aged person especially, so much more credibility and persuasiveness in critiques of reclamation when their authors admit to a recognition of the power and impressiveness and maybe even the beauty of the dams. That seems to me Incredible. The purity and consistency thing, that's back to the mosaic of one color. That's not of particular interest. Now, here's a, a quotation from that same essay that I think we could have people guess for quite a long time. Uh, if you read this passage and you said, who wrote this? Uh, I think people would be really, really guessing, but it is a beautiful passage and one that I think many people in the room will have to admit honestly expressed as a feeling they've had themselves from time to time. Okay. They started off on their road trip in 1946. I should rather begin with how it feels to be out on the road again, dry camping in the desert, hitting the road after five years of rationing and restrictions in World War II, doing what a good third of America is doing in the summer of 1946 if the polls and the prophecies mean anything. For many people, and I sympathize with them, one of the least bearable wartime deprivations was the loss of their mobility. We are a wheeled people. It seems to me sometimes that I must have been born with a steering wheel in my hands, and I realize now that to lose the use of a car is practically equivalent to, using, to losing the use of my legs. Returning to the road after a layoff of several years is like reestablishing intimacy with a wife or lover. There are a hundred things once known and long forgotten that crowd forward upon the senses, and there is the sharp thrill of recognition in all of them. Now, I think that is a spectacular passage. It is one of the finest summations of the seductiveness of the automobile. It is such a fine reminder of our complicity, our collective actions that have resulted. I mean, how many people in Boulder, Colorado, who are on the highest ground environmentally, have put their mountain bikes on their SUVs and driven to an appropriate place to use them? Now, of course, that is different because when you are driving in a state of grace, that changes the emissions on that. So it's a concern that. Anyway, there again, I just think that is a fine, fine contribution. Nothing to flinch over, nothing to be embarrassed in that, but really to say 
how great that a fine writer of Mr. Stegner's caliber gave us such a pointed, memorable tribute to the joy of driving a car. Um, that doesn't mean we have to stick with that joy. It doesn't mean we can't rethink it. But I really see that as adding to his validity and force as a critic of our, of our habits. But the larger point here is as we travel through space and time, the mark of our passing is going to be a trail of contradictions left behind us. And our heirs and successors had better learn to breathe deeply and accept this rich heritage from us. In Stegner's case, the mixed genres, the way in which Wolf Willow, for instance, is a history, a story, and a memoir. The fiction, and the, uh, the fiction carries messages, and the nonfiction carries messages. All of this made me value my circumstances, uh, which I value a great deal anyway, even more that I'm I remarried after being widowed, and I have two stepchildren who are remarkably interesting people. Uh, we were talking about John McPhee's when they were nine and 11. We were talking about John McPhee's encounters with the arts druid and describing that to them. The nine-year-old said, are you sure that is nonfiction? The way you describe it, it seems so arranged and artful in how it's put together. Are you sure it is not fiction? We said, oh no, it seems to be nonfiction. The 11-year-old said, I think you are speaking of the wrong genre. She said, I think you were actually speaking of allegory now. <laughs> well, <laughs> I married well in this situation. So, uh, so that was a very memorable conversation. And that has helped me with this, that much, so much of what Mr. Steger was doing was really, if you were doing the fiction, nonfiction genre debate, you're missing it. Allegory is much more that. So that in Beyond the 100th Meridian, John Wesley Powell, is a character in allegory, and Colorado's first territorial governor, William Gilpin, is a character in allegory. If you, the sterility of critiquing it as a historical work is evident when you get to that. William Gilpin is actually, I mean, of all things in life, I've actually had impulses of wanting to defend William Gilpin, which I didn't expect to have happen to me. Um, but Gilpin and Powell in real life were much more complex than they can be in an allegory. The characters in Pilgrim's Progress are, are characters in an allegory, and that's what Powell and Gilpin are, and they have a great deal more effect in that form than they would have um, if they were not in such an expansive genre for communicating meaning. So, and Powell, of course, was the great pioneer in creative nonfiction, taking two different journeys in two different years and smushing them into one journey. There's a little matter of creating allegory from that. So, uh, Stegner's main alchemy, of course, to take a personal story of root rootlessness, migration, mobility, disconnection, and to transform that, or to not to give up the rootlessness and the disconnection, but to keep that and turn that into a story of connectedness, of rootedness. There's, there's a matter that makes William Dean Howells look a little simple in comparison with his contradictions, but just as we respect, for our Mr. Stegner, respect uh, Howells's complexity, we respect that in Mr. Stegner. Well, my concluding remarks are actually from uh, framed by the Bible, which is a little bit of a surprise to me. I think it would have been a surprise to Mr. Stegner to hear that. I'm, uh, Isaiah 53, 3, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. That phrase is going to be one of the main ones here. And Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I use the word sin here, partly because he used that when I knelt with the beer can and urged me to give it up. And also because he was a user of the term, for instance, if the unrestrained engineering of a Western water system was original sin, as I believe it was, it was essentially a sin of scale. So reclamation, original sinners. So few women employed by the Bureau of Reclamation, and Eve is so important in the original sin story. It's a little bit of a disparity there. <laughs> So uh, these are my next few minutes here. I'm just going to take off from those two quotations and reflect a little bit. The 1960s and 1970s were hard times for Wallace Stegner at the university. And now I, I make a statement I've never made in public before, which is, I am so glad I never had Ken Kesey as my student. <laughs> I thank my lucky stars. <laughs> and in truth, 
A dose of repression might have been exactly what Ken Kesey needed. I love the Ken Kesey no novel, sometimes a great notion, and um, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, but a little bit more repression, and we might have had more of a oeuvre from the man uh, from that. I remember with, with fear and trembling at a time in the early 70s, 20 more minutes, and then including question and answer, but okay. Um, so I remember with fear, a, a terrible time in the early 70s, I guess the students had taken me to be a much hipper person than I was, and one morning, a, a student named John called me, and he said, oh, um, John and Peter and I were uh, tripping on acid yesterday. We were having quite a terrible time. And we thought, you know, Patty can help us. We'll go to Patty's apartment, and she'll help us. And thank heavens they forgot where my apartment was. So <laughs> that was really lucky. So I guess I will say I now stand before you as a middle-aged professor who would melt down with tension and frustration if the students of 2009 went out on strike and would not take my final and would not let me put together the grades from my course. So whatever I used to feel flinching over poor Mr. Stegner's discomfort in the 60s, I think, 60s and 70s, I think. Well, what do you know? I share a little bit of, um, of that feeling myself. So Mr. Stegner had appropriate anxieties, understandable anxieties, about the Frankenstein monsters that a writing program releases. That's what a writing program does. It brings in little pieces and parts and turns them into Frankenstein monsters and sends them out. And sometimes the Frankenstein monsters do what you want them to do, and sometimes they go out and tear up the town. So it's an anxious business, um, and it's an exhilarating business when you shift over, which is going to be the point at the end. So the question now, as we consider Mr. Stegner's heritage, uh, in the 1960s and the 1970s were not a great time for joining these arguments and putting them together and having the spirited debate with Stegner that uh, might have been very productive if that could have happened. So I'm now going to say something which I never have said in public before, which is that I do not like Lyman Ward. I was chatting with a flight attendant on a plane on the East Coast this last weekend, an African-American woman who's a big reader, and she asked me, I was, had my Stegner books there, and she said, should she read Angle of Repose? I thought, oh, there's this very irritating man there. He's going to get in your way. I want you to <laughs> get past him, but he will keep coming in, and will have a ridiculous fantasy at the end. And I'm you're such a nice flight attendant. I don't really feel like doing that to you. So <laughs> uh, now what I was saying to the flight attendant in my own way is that I uh, cannot get Lyman Ward out of my mind, and that must be a measure of a successful writer and a successful character if you think, Time for you to go, Mr. Ward, out of my mind, and he stays. That is a very interesting thing. It does bring to mind that Twain uh, remark, the author shall make the reader feel a deep interest in the personages of his tale and in their fate, and he shall make the reader love the good people in the tale and hate the bad ones. But the reader of the Deerslayer tale dislikes the good people in it, is indifferent to the others, and wishes they would all get drowned together. Well, if, Mr. if Lyman Ward had gone to Oregon and done assisted suicide, I would have thought, <sighs> You weren't enjoying life anyway. <laughs> so that is something I certainly never said to Mr. Stegner. And I kind of, I, and I do, I fully give the tribute that that must be a very successful characterization. If that character is with me and haunts me and will not depart when asked to, to leave my mind. So that is the measure of a successful character. But that is a conversation that would be at least worth having among our, ourselves. But now we turn to that other phrase, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. Um, I'm glad that Lyman Ward irritated me as much as he did because it calmed me down. It gave me uh, something to think about besides the human tragedies there. Mr. Stegner wrote some of the saddest, most moving pieces of fiction I can imagine. When I read The Big Rock Candy Mountain, I was sitting in a public reading area in the Yale Library, in Sterling Library, and I began to cry so hard I thought, they're going to take me to the paramedics if I don't finish this book in private, so I slunk off to the stacks where nobody could see me and finished it there. I was reading Crossing to Safety on a tiny, tiny plane out of Cortez, Colorado, and as I came in the last 30 or 40 pages, I thought, are there FAA rules on this? If a passenger begins weeping really hard, does that indicate you know something about the plane? Does that <laughs> alarm the other passengers? So A Man of Sorrow and Acquainted with Grief, uh, Fred, Philip Fredkin's book helps us in every way to understand the story behind that, he quotes, um, Philip Fradkin quotes Stegner writing about his father and that really, I, I don't, grief I think is kind of a word for the, for the father he wanted that he could not ever have. Getting even was the only one impulse Stegner wrote and not a very attractive one of what moved me. 
I also found myself wanting to understand, to make a reconciliation of some kind, to soothe my own anger and unease, to lay his, his the father's troubled and troubling ghost to rest. And now I quote Philip Fredkin, Stegner's lifelong attempt to heal himself, he termed it self-therapy, didn't work. He thought he finally had achieved it in the novel re recapitulation, but he hadn't, which doesn't mean that he didn't try mightily. Of that autobiographical novel, Stegner said, I measure the strength of the intention by the difficulty and exasperation of getting a handle on it. And this is the sentence that I just can't, I wish you hadn't written it, Philip. <laughs> Shortly after re recapitulation was published in 1979, Stegner vowed he would never buy a tombstone for his father's grave. 70 years old, he was 70 years old, and he couldn't make that gesture. Now, the greatest uh, fable, parable, allegory of all, I think, in this whole story is the way that Wallace Stegner, having had a wretched father, having stayed at age 70 so angry, so done in by that, that he couldn't make the symbolic gesture of the gravestone, having had such a wretched, miserable experience with his own father, Wallace Stegner became the affirming and encouraging father figure of so many Western writers. I know Steve Trimble and I have in common a moment of intense and lasting, not just a moment, exhilaration when Wallace Stegner told the Bloomsbury Review that in 1988 he had read two books he liked, Stephen Trimble's book and, the, and Mind the Legacy of Conquest, which was a great thing for a father figure to do. So the fact that this man could make that transition and become such a provider of that fatherly encouragement is a spectacular allegory. A pedestal is a cold and lonely place to put somebody. It's one way of putting it. The uh, minister, William Sloan Coffin, used to say, taking off from the pop psychology book of the time, used to say, I'm not okay, you're not okay, and that's okay which is, in fact, the statement of true and lasting liberation. Or, as Romans 3, 23 says, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I end with a couple of passages here. Um, when Mr. Stegner was in Boulder in 1988, he gave a talk, and this was the conclusion of the talk. When I ponder the effects of the, that the American dream has already had on the country I knew 65 or 70 years ago, I remember the advice that Satan gave the world at the end of Mark Twain's The Mysterious Stranger. Dream other dreams and better, Satan advised. Satan was speaking of the dream of human life and speaking as, as a pessimist, but as a person of wide experience, he should be listened to and his wisdom applied wherever it works. Dream other dreams and better. So I was giving a talk a couple years after Mr. Stegner's death at the University of New Mexico. And I was, going, I was talking about Wallace Stegner, and I was going to conclude with that very passage. I was maybe three minutes from reading that passage from Mr. Stegner. I was giving this talk, and I don't recommend this for anyone in the public speaking world. I was giving a speech on Halloween night, which is really not a good night to be out playing the part or dressed up as a public speaker when other people are in funnier costumes by a long shot than, than that. So, so I'm uh, coming to my conclusion. I'm two or three minutes away from reading this, and I look in the back corner of a big lecture hall, and a person, well, who knows, Satan has walked in at the back <laughs> of the room. And, I, and that is a surprise to me, and I, uh, there's all these people in the audience who are not looking over their shoulder who don't know that Satan has come to the room, so I said, well, uh, hi, I said, I, I was about to quote you. And so, <laughs> so everybody turns and looks, and there's Satan. And then a minute or two later, I read this passage, and we have Satan saying, dream other dreams and better. And then at the end of the, uh, well, so then the talk ends, that's the last line. And then we have question and answer. And the first question is from Satan, who said, could you give me the citation for where I said that? So, <laughs> so Wallace Stegner had a sense of humor, and I can't help but think that that would have struck him maybe even funnier than it, than it, struck, it struck me. Uh, I end with the most quoted of Mr. Stegner's quotable lines that, on this theme of the lines that guide us through uh, time, time and space. And he, of course, this is the passage that he knew 
Of course, he knew it was, it was quoted and quoted and quoted. He knew that much of what had happened in the American West seemed to have undermined it or contradicted it or given it less um, truth. But speaking of contradictions and speaking of living with those contradictions and accepting them as the legacy, this still seems to me a passage to continue quoting. Angry as one may be at what careless people have done and still do to a noble habitat, it is hard to be pessimistic about the West. This is the native home of hope. When the West fully learns that cooperation, not rugged individualism, is the pattern that most characterizes it and preserves it, then it will have achieved itself and outlived its origins. Then it has a chance to create a society to match its scenery. Thank you. In your uh, legacy of conquest, which I happened to pick up in the Milwaukee airport as I was coming here, uh, so I was reading it on the plane. <laughs> Uh, you begin with that first chapter called The Empire of Innocence, and you develop this notion of thematic of the uh, injured innocent in there. And I was just wondering if you see there a convergence between what you were writing there in that book and obviously books like Angle of Repose or uh, even Big Rock Candy Mountain, particularly as it applies to women, with the women in, oh, in those two oh, books by oh. Wallace Stegner. Well, uh, it's interesting you would ask that question because I, I struggled with how to place a couple of quotations from Mr. Stegner's essay, Born a Square, or is that the right title? Yeah. And I, I couldn't, I would need more time than I had to treat that the way I wanted to because several places in that essay, Mr. Stegner says that the white male Western writer can't be the victim, everybody else. This is published in 1964, I think it's something like that. Everybody else is going to town as the victim. Everybody else. And it's, and it's a very uncomfortable essay to read because he does the catalog of the, the homosexuals and the Negroes and so on. And they all get to be victims. And the poor white male Western writer can't claim victimization, but artists have to be victims and have to be... I mean, for somebody whose earliest memory was of an orphanage, he could be a victim if he wanted to on, on that. So I, I started to try to think of how I would work that whole line of thought in there. And then, as you'll notice, I bailed <laughs> and didn't, didn't try that. Um, I, I'm struck in Mr. Fredkin's book when there's a passage about Stegner being criticized by people who have not read One Nation for his insensitivity on race. I think Philip Fredkin's phrase is, two white women came to Stegner's defense, which would be me and my... Uh, <laughs> And uh, delightfully, my former student, Beth Ledow, who's a wonderful, wonderful person, so I couldn't be prouder than to be allied with Beth on that. I think uh, that we were locked in a phase in the writing of Western literature and history where all the women had to be admirable for a long time, and they had to be uh, treated with, uh, well, kid gloves seems like an odd phrase. And, and that is dehumanizing. I think it's really a, a, a difficult cause to move beyond, though, that we were really stuck with the, when we put women in, we must admire them. My wonderful friend, Ann Scott, was a historian at Duke, wonderful historian, and she was writing about women's clubs in the, all around the United States. And I remember clearly in the early 80s, she was agonized because she found women's clubs, white women's clubs that were um, rigorously racist. And Ann was in, a, oh, what shall I do? I Let them be human beings put it in there, talk about that. So I think Stegner wandered into a battlefield when it came to representing women in Western literature. And it might have been nice to just say, this is going into an archive, whatever I write about women will go into an archive, and when you all settle on this, when you decide that women can be full human beings in Western writing, then we'll release it. But I, I'm, I'm not doing too well in getting to the, the point on that, but it's just, I, I guess, I would disagree. I think the letter to his mother is one of the most awkward and painful things I've ever seen in my life, and I, I'm so sorry that he locked on that. I mean, that's part of the rage against his father, and it, so excessive sympathy for women might have been more the problem than a lack of that. So anyway, you can see why I didn't try to put this in the speech because it's not working out so well. But, um, but I believe he was. He would have. He, he read that in Legacy. He must have, uh, since he seems to have liked the book, he must have recognized that way in which the role of white women and the 
protection and valuing of white women was in some ways a justification for conquest and invasion, and he must have known that and must have been attentive to that. But that, how that could figure in angle of repose, I'm not quite sure. So, okay. Okay, well, we're going to the 22nd soundbite answer after this, so. But thank you, that was a really good question. Yeah. Uh, my question goes to your um, quoting Satan and the um, um, dream other dreams. Dream other I, dreams. I, I'm not quite sure w w how I'm supposed to take that in the sense that um, Stegner writes about the American dream uh, being behind the Bureau of Reclamation and building dams. And now you, you're quoting Satan saying, dream other dreams. Is that Satan leading us into temptation? Hmm. Or is that Satan speaking truth? In other words, give up the American dream and find another dream. Well, I think in the context of Twain's use of Satan, it'd be very nice to know what Satan would say for himself in this, because now we're always, so-and-so uh, said that so-and-so said that Satan said, and that's a little bit hard for anybody to, to deal with. But Satan was saying, Twain had Satan saying that the dream of humanity as a self-conscious species that could choose good or evil and could uh, live in some degree of thought and harmony, that that was the dream that had failed. So when Stegner says Staten was speaking as a pessimist but a person of wisdom, it's that very harsh and bitter decision that humanity didn't come through, that the, uh, there is no redemption after the fall that we just felt. Uh, but fallen short of the glory of God is different from fell beyond redemption. And I think that's what Mr. Stegner was going for with dream other dreams and better. Don't, um, well, the better, the accent is on the better. And learn the lessons of the misfortunes and anguish and unintended consequences that came from the first round of dreaming. Apply those lessons, but don't give up the geography of hope. Don't give up the... The faith, so it's it's be uh, well. Be more careful about what you dream. Be wiser as you dream it. Think through the with some degree of foresight the consequences of that. But it's it's not oh just go ahead and sin some more. It's not that though. That would be pleasant if it were. I guess in some ways it would take the burden off us for consciences would have a great field day on that. So uh, one one more and then I think we're. Embracing the, right, embracing the incompatibilities, exactly. Thank you, Melody. That's why we have actual literary scholars here on these occasions. To... You could have done his question in a minute, Melody. That's not fair. And you will, I guess, probably in your talk. Well, you'll, okay. Uh, anyone? One more question, and then I'm gone. I do suddenly realize I'm between you and lunch, so. Okay, well, thank you very much.